Hey, it's Mr. Lineski with your first video for Unit 2, our logic unit. Our first video today is on inductive reasoning and conditional statements. Um, so getting started, what is inductive reasoning? Inductive reasoning is whenever we use patterns um, or a pattern of some sorts um, to arrive at some conclusion. So we see a pattern happening, we make a conclusion. Um, that conclusion is called a conjecture. Um, and that's a concluding statement that you use based on a pattern. Um, so if you take a look at example one, here's an example of where we can use some inductive reasoning to come up with what's going to be next in the pattern. Um, and so if you take a look here, we have um, sort of just squares stacked up. So there's three squares, three squares, three squares. Uh, but each time I move up a pattern, I'm adding another square to each row. So it says write a conjecture that describes the pattern and then use your conjecture to describe the next two patterns. So what are we doing? We're going to add an additional square to each column. So columns go up and down. Um, and so our fourth piece would look like this with a fifth square inside each one and then pattern number five would still have three in the middle. Three, four, six. Woo, that's not a good looking square. Um, and would look something like this. So patterns can be something that we use um, in shapes or it can be something numerical. So if we take a look at these numbers, two, four, eight, sixteen, how am I getting from one number to the next? Um, well, at first I'm adding two, then I add four, then I add eight. Um, realistically, what's happening here, though, is I'm multiplying each number by 2. Um, so 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times 4 is 8, 8 times 2 is 16, 16 times 2 is 32, and 32 times 2 is 64. So that's inductive reasoning. Uh, if we ever want to show that a conjecture is wrong, if someone makes a claim um, and you want to prove them wrong, that's called a counterexample. Counterexamples are used to show that a conjecture is not true, and all it ever takes is one counterexample to disprove a conjecture. So if I said the conjecture here that all birds can fly, if you're like, hey, wait a sec, Mr. Lineski, that's not true. Penguins don't fly. That's an example of a bird that doesn't fly. Therefore, you've proved my conjecture wrong. Another conjecture I hear, uh, sort of a math one, it says the opposite of a number is always smaller than the original number. So one such counterexample is, well, the opposite of negative 2 is 2, and so 2 is greater than negative 2. So that's an example where the opposite of a number is not smaller than the other. Um, all supplementary angles are linear pairs. Your counterexample especially in this class, uh, does not always need to be written words. You could actually draw something and say, hey, wait a sec. If I have these angles, those are supplementary. They add to 180, but they're not a linear pair. They're not even adjacent. So that's a counterexample there. And then the last one here, point M is between J and K. M is in the middle of J and K. So is that true? No because J and K is here, and just because M is in between that doesn't mean we can say it's in the middle. Uh, M could be there, and that's a counterexample. Um, If-then statements um, are sometimes referred to as conditional statements, um, and they are in the form of if P then Q. Um, Sometimes you may see it written out symbolically. It looks like this. So if P, then Q. Um, and so what we're saying here is that the hypothesis of a conditional statement is always followed by the word if. And most of the time, that's our P statement. The conclusion is the conditional statement or phrase that follows the word then. And that's typically our Q. So if you take a look at uh, example number seven, we're asked to identify the hypothesis by underlining it, and then the conclusion by drawing a box around it. So it says, if the sum of two angles is 180 degrees, then the angles are supplementary. So notice, I have my if, I have my then. That's a conditional statement. 
Um, so the hypothesis is what comes after the word it. So we'll put an underline after the stuff it. Notice I did not include it. And then that means our conclusion is here. Typically, you will see them in the form if something, then something else, if P, then Q. So this is kind of my P scenario. This is my Q scenario. Um, but if you take a look at the next example, it says Ricky will get an A on his geometry test if he studies for the test. Well, notice if is now the second part. So that means this is still my hypothesis. This is still P. If he studies for the test, and I could kind of sneak the word then up front here, then Ricky will get an A on his geometry tests. So that's one where it's sort of flipped a little bit. Um, numbers 9 and 10 just sort of have you writing them out, but it's essentially the same thing. If it helps you to underline and put a box, if it rains on Saturday, then I will not uh, go to work on a bike. So my hypothesis is it rains on Saturday. My conclusion is I will not go to work on a bike. Notice I did not include the word if and then here. Um, an angle that measures 57 degrees is an acute angle. Now notice the words if and then do not appear anywhere in here. So it helps to kind of put them in somewhere where it makes sense grammatically. So you could say something like if an angle um, has a measurement or if an angle measures 57 degrees, then it is an acute angle. So you're allowed to kind of manipulate the words a little bit. So my hypothesis could be an angle that measures 57 degrees or an angle measures 57 degrees. And my conclusion would be uh, the angle is acute. All right, that is it for the first video. Thank you for watching. I know it and now you know it.